Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the, to the Roman church, chapter 8, verses 9 through 17. If you'd like to follow along, it is on page 800 in your pew Bibles. Hear now these words of Paul. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 27. If you'd like to follow along, it is on page 764 in your pew Bibles. Hear now these words of Jesus. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will, be with, and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives you. But do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. In May of this year, a driver in Germany was going almost twice the speed limit, going roughly 40 miles per hour in a 20 mile per hour zone, and of course was caught by a traffic camera. But the driver was spared the fine of almost 120 American dollars because a white bird obscured the driver's face when the picture was taken, meaning that the officials could not confirm who the driver of the car was. The official police statement had a little fun because they suggested that, quote, it was no coincidence that the Holy Spirit intervened. 
We have understood the sign and leave the speeder in peace this time. They also joked that the bird deserved the fine, but they would, quote, allow grace to prevail. We continue our series through the Apostles' Creed today. As a reminder, the Apostles' Creed was, is roughly 1,200 years old, but it finds its basis in the confessions of the early church, and the early church confessed what they found in Scripture. So far, we have covered the work and ministry of the first two persons of the triune God, God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And now today, we turn to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. I think it's rather fascinating that the Apostles' Creed, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, doesn't exactly give a whole lot. It simply reads, I believe in the Holy Spirit, period. That's all it says. Although I can't really blame it, of the three persons of the triune God, I think this reflects how the Holy Spirit isn't always understood as he should be or could be. The Holy Spirit is hard to understand for us Christians at times. Scripture refers to the Spirit and the work of the Spirit all the way through Scripture, but it doesn't always give us the straight answers that a lot of times at least I desire or I want. No biblical author gives us a really good, in-depth, long chapter about who the Spirit is and what he does. Unfortunately, in give or take a little bit, we, we have to string together some scriptures and we have to kind of knit them together for us to understand the nature and the work of the Holy Spirit. At least for us, the Holy Spirit appears for scripture, in Scripture quite early, actually in the second verse of the whole Bible. In Genesis 1-2, we read, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit has been there since the beginning. Throughout the Old Testament, we see many, many references to the Spirit of God. Most often, the Spirit was the one who anointed and spoke through the prophets, as well as anointed uh, many of the kings of Israel. But it was the prophet Joel who spoke that one day, the Spirit of God would be poured out upon all the people of God, not just the prophets, not just the kings, but all of believers. In the Great Commission, which was given in Jesus in Matthew 28, he tells his disciples to baptize new disciples, quote, in the, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In this formula, Jesus places the Spirit on an equal level with the Father and the Son, the triune God. What we see in our two scripture readings this morning from Romans 8 and John 14, we understand what the main role of God the Holy Spirit is, and that is to apply the work of God the Son. In our text from the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking with his disciples about his upcoming ascension, how he is going to return back to the right hand of the Father, which we talked about last week. Jesus promises that when he ascends back to the Father, the Father will send another, which Jesus calls in Greek, the paraclete. Now, if you're reading from the New International Version in, in, in the Pew Bibles, the NIV translates this word paraclete as counselor. And I think that's good, but we'll get to that a little bit in a second. This word paraclete is unique to John's writings in the New Testament. He's the only one that seems to call the Spirit this. It essentially, its definition is essentially someone who comes alongside and often occurs in secular Greek literature as a description for an advocate in a court of law. A paraclete is someone who comes alongside someone else to speak in his or her defense and to provide counsel. 
This is often why we translate it as counselor or advocate. The Spirit is the one who comes alongside of us. Now, I do want to note that Jesus says in verse 15 that the Father will send another paraclete. Jesus isn't saying that the Father will send another person that is the paraclete, but another advocate. John, in his first letter later on in in the New Testament, says that Jesus himself is an advocate. As we talked about last week, one of the main roles of Jesus ascending back to the Father is he is an advocate. He speaks on our behalf at the side of the Father. The Spirit is a second, another advocate. If we put that together, this means that the work of the Spirit is a continuation of Jesus' work with his disciples, as we see in in the book, The Acts of the Apostles. In verse 17 of John 14, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth. It is the Spirit who communicates truth about God, which in essence is what Jesus' work was all about, was communicating Jesus, God's truth and word. We know that Jesus himself is the truth, along with the way and the life, which he himself said in verse 6 of the same chapter, and the same goes with the Spirit. The Spirit continues to defend the truth of Jesus. And in this same passage, Jesus tells the disciples they need not worry. They will be able to recognize the Holy Spirit because the Spirit has been with them all along in Jesus. In our text from Romans 8, the Apostle Paul is writing and and celebrating about the new life that Christians enjoy in the Holy Spirit as a result of Jesus' work. In verse 9, Paul explains how those who believe and follow Christ have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. It's kind of like what Susie talked about in the children's moment, the light inside of us. The Holy Spirit is is inside of us. Verse 10 sees how Paul talks about Christ dwelling in his people. The work of Christ, the work of the Spirit, work together in tandem, in cooperation inside each of us. It is the Holy Spirit's presence which testifies that we have the new life that Christ offers. Starting in verse 12, Paul draws the conclusion that since Christians have the Holy Spirit inside of us, That means we are no longer slaves to the sinful ways of this world, but the Spirit enables us, empowers us to live lives that serve and give glory to God. I would probably add, if only we would listen to him. Even as Christians, we can still snuff out the Spirit's speaking to us and and, uh, we can still end up following our own selfish desires chase after our own selfish wants and needs. But it is the Holy Spirit who tries to bring us back to the way of Christ. But we need not worry. Even if we do neglect the Spirit's words, it is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives that gives us the assurance that we are the sons and daughters of God. As Paul says in verse 16, the Holy Spirit is our witness, our advocate, the one true proof that we belong to the family of Christ, that indeed we are truly the children of the living God. This is all to say that the the Holy Spirit is the continuing presence of Jesus in our lives, and it is the Holy Spirit who helps us continue the work of Jesus in the world. When the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in Jerusalem at Pentecost, the Spirit was the fire that was lit inside each of them that drove them out of their hiding room to proclaim the message of Jesus to the crowds present, even if the crowds did think that they were drunk at 9 a.m. in the morning. It was the Spirit who drove Philip to instruct the Ethiopian eunuch who was out in the middle of nowhere reading a, 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 a text from the prophet Isaiah and it was the spirit who led Philip to say, no, this text 
points to Jesus. It was the Spirit who guided and directed the apostles to where to go and where to preach and where to serve and how to serve. It is the Spirit of the living God who dwells in me and you and each of us and serves as the assurance, the seal of God's love and grace for us. In honor of Reformation Sunday, it was the Spirit who guided Martin Luther to realize that the way of the church had not gone the way of Jesus and needed to be corrected, to be reformed. It is the Spirit of the living Christ who spoke to me and said, I am called to serve Christ's church. It is the Spirit who speaks to each one of you and says, you are called to serve Christ's church. It is the Holy Spirit who speaks and guides each of us every day to speak and to comfort someone who is sad, who is lonely. It is the Spirit who speaks and guides each one of us to take care of and love our friends and our family. It is the Spirit who speaks and guides each of us to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, care for the sick, etc. It is the Holy Spirit who is sent by the Father in the name of the Son, who teaches us all things. It reminds us of everything Jesus has taught us. It is a spirit who faithfully helps us recall Jesus' words and guides us in all truth. Now the guidance of the spirit can be sometimes a tricky thing. Sometimes there are people who have come before the church and they proclaim, I feel like the Holy Spirit has led me to do X. Or the Spirit has laid this upon my heart. But after some digging, after running through the scriptures, after reviewing them against Jesus' words, they seem to run contrary to the words and teachings of Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not say anything that is not in line with what Jesus has said and taught. The whole point of the Holy Spirit's ministry is to talk about Jesus, is to point to Jesus, always pushing us to follow Jesus on his way. What is the Holy Spirit telling you right now? Where is he leading you? Are you listening to him? Or are you ignoring what the Spirit is trying to tell you? If you do believe that the Spirit is speaking to you, is it the Spirit talking or is it your own wants and desires? Does it align with the words of Jesus? As Christians, we believe in and hopefully, or at least try to listen to the Holy Spirit because he speaks truth. He opens our hearts, he brings us to Jesus, and he leads us in obedience to the commandments of our Lord. Truly, the Holy Spirit is our helper, our advocate, the one who walks alongside of us on our faith journey. And what a helper he is. Because if we didn't have him, I don't know where we would be. But thanks be to God that he is with us. Amen.